welcome. If this makes you feel dumb, know that I know. <laughs> this is the room, right? It, I'm not in the wrong room. <laughs> this is the I'm in the right room. These are the people. The smell of grease paint, the roar of the crowd. Actors are delighted to be back on stage after the pandemic's enforced hiatus. But are we, the audience, ready for live performances? Well, one show is asking that question while we're in the room. Stand Up If You're Here Tonight was written by John Colvenbach and it's performed by Jim Ortlieb. And they join me today in the studio to tell us more. Welcome, both of you. Oh, thank Thanks you for having, much us. for having us. Now, you've brought the show to Paris after a few very successful runs in the United States. This is a unique creation. There's one man on stage addressing the audience. I describe it as existential, maybe a bit absurd. Jim, tell me first, what is this man seeking? Contact, connection to uh, people that he has not been in contact with for a long time. And really, it's, uh, it's, it could have something to do with the pandemic. It could have something to do with uh, people not getting along these days in different ways. Or it could just have to be a, a, a part of his own psyche and who he is. And I think that's more like it. <laughs> John, what Wouldn't about you? you? <laughs> well, I mean, what do you think the audience are looking for when they go into that room? Yeah, that's a good question. So I was thinking about that when I first started to work on the play, is what's the audience expectation? And what's my expectation when I go to see a play? What do I... What's the dream? And sometimes that dream is disappointed, right? But what do you really want from, from theater attendance? And that's sort of how I got into it at the beginning. W what I want is something that Jimmy's character talks about in the play, which is a kind of soul-to-soul -soul connection, which is a kind of blurring of yourself and the artwork itself, which almost never happens. It's impossible to try to get to on... Pr it, you can't have that. As your goal, you'll never find it. But... The idea that you could be in a dark room and lose your ego, lose yourself, lose the border of your sort of face almost, and become one with the art, that's sort of what I always want. So Jimmy's character in the show, explicitly and sometimes comedically and sometimes in a harebrained way, is trying to achieve that with the audience. He's trying to achieve a kind of union. OK, transcend normal life. Well, let's get a feel for the performance. This is Jim in Stand Up If You're Here Tonight. I know what it took for you to get here. The babysitter was late, and when she finally did show up, she was clearly drunk and still. You left your three-year-old in her care. The train smelled of digestion. You breathed through your mouth for an hour. Your television called to you. You turned your back on it. The siren song of streaming, of lounging, with the collapsed lumbar of mouth breathing. You assembled yourself and you got into your car and you got yourself here. I know you did and I know how hard it was. So that certainly feels very relatable. I think it was already hard enough to leave the house to enjoy art and then yeah. the pandemic struck, isolating us even more. John, was this a lockdown project for you? When did you start writing it? It was, yeah. So I started uh, in the spring of 2000. 21. And Jimmy and I did, and we did it first in LA in the summer of 21. And we ran for about three months. Then we did it in Chicago in the spring of 22. Okay. And now here, yeah. And Jim, there is a little bit of audience participation involved. Were you nervous that people wouldn't be so enthusiastic about that, especially here in Paris? What's the response been like? Uh, well, audiences have been very receptive. But when I first read the play, I, I said, Stand up if you're here tonight. It, it, it sounds like audience participation. John, I don't like audience participation. <laughs> so I was anxious about it. It makes me anxious, but it has less to do... I, I tell you, people are very... They lack a self-consciousness when it comes to this play. There's such a curiosity. They don't know really what I want. And, and it makes them curious to know, because it's really so funny, they're curious to know why is he doing and what can I do to help? Sometimes people are over rambunctious about actually participating. Sometimes when I ask them to do something, they go out of their way to do even more. It's sort of <laughs> astonishing. 
Okay, that's very interesting because yeah. it's a characteristic of the play. And speaking of artistic styles, when we look back in the history of art, sometimes huge natural disasters or world events uh, like wars can really influence art, either the content of it or the mood. How do you think we'll characterise post-pandemic art? Well, so what I think is that, uh, at least for me, my experience, I live in New York City. The pandemic to me made... Uh, the difficulties of modern life worse. They already existed. The difficulties being isolation, loneliness, a kind of uh, disconnection from the community. And the pandemic just multiplied all of those existing things um, in my life as a New Yorker. And so I think, I hope that the reaction, you know, in the United States now, we're just at each other's throats. We, we hate each other. Everyone hates somebody. And so that's unhealthy. And it's, and it's, it's been this sort of cultural moment for five or six years, and we can't seem to get out of it. And so this play is, a, is just a little attempt to say we have more in common than not, and that being a human being is what we all share, and that we're all born, we're all going to die in the end. And the thing in between, what if we tried to do it um, without suspicion of one another, it's a little, you know, it it's intentionally uh, sort of a bit of sentimentalism in a way, and I think I hope that it takes uh, people by surprise because it's Jimmy's out there to connect to the audience, no matter what, and so I I hope we break down uh, the wall of their alienation a mm -hmm. little bit. Maybe that will be what characterises it. Mm. Well, it's not only uh, global pandemics that can stop us engaging with art. Sometimes it's a fear of being bored by a performance or not really understanding what we're looking at. Curators at a German museum recently discovered that a piece by Dutch painter Piet Mondrian had been hanging upside down since 1945. Camille Nedelec explains. To enjoy this iconic painting as the artist intended, it needs to be turned on its head. Or at least what art historians thought was its head. New evidence suggests New York City One has been hanging upside down for almost 80 years. It was at an exhibition in Dusseldorf in Germany that this curator realised the mistake. A photo from 1944 shows New York City One on an easel, but it was turned 180 degrees. It was in Mondrian's studio. Mondrian had just passed away. Presumably that's how he'd chosen to position the painting. The error may have happened during transit. As Mondrian hadn't signed his abstract work, there was no easy way to tell which end was up. The pioneer of neoplasticism wanted to distill art into its purest state, using only primary colours and straight lines. He moved to the US in 1940, and the cityscape inspired his New York series. Flipping the painting would place the work's biggest cluster of geometric lines at the top, mirroring his other works. Amazingly turned around, it looks very, very good. The painting's colourful tape is now increasingly fragile and risks falling off if moved. Curators have decided it's better to see New York City one the wrong way round than not at all. So it turns out we were looking at it the wrong way round the whole time, not as Mondrian made it. Now, John, do you think we need to get art? Do you think that, for example, the audience needs to understand your intentions? That's a good question. You know, so... I don't want this to be too long of an answer, but one thing with this play was, I thought about my intention as a writer being the only existing part of the play that's left. There's no time. There's really no character. There's no plot, not really. There's no setting. The only thing that's left really uh, of a traditional play would be the author's intention, sort of embodied by, by Jimmy in this play. So do they need to understand what I'm after? I hope they do. <laughs> I hope they do. We, you know, it's a play where anything can happen. So sometimes it's a euphoria and sometimes it all kinds of craziness can happen. So more than anything I've ever been involved with, every show is different. Sometimes they leave uh, buoyed and sometimes disturbed. You never know.
Now, Jim, looking back at your career, you've had dozens of roles in television, <clears throat> or in Broadway productions, in smaller theatrical uh, projects. One of your recent projects was the musical version of The Devil Wears Prada. Uh, yeah. Now, in that, the music comes courtesy of Elton John. What was it like working with a Sir Elton? Well, he has been very busy on the road with his, uh, from what I understand, his final, final tour. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure, but uh, uh, he was, he's lovely when he comes to visit, but he's not around very, very much. And I, from what I hear, there might be a possibility that we, after he's done this November, he may be going home to, to England and we may be, um, there's a rumor that some of that may be floating around in London. Okay, well, finally, we asked you for a cultural tip, something that you've really enjoyed recently. And, John, you flagged up a film, The Banshees of Inishirin, with Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson. What was it about the film that impressed you so much? Well, so the writer is Martin McDonough, who is a brilliant playwright, a, a brilliant playwright. And so I'll see anything that he makes. And this is um, a, a, a relationship story, uh, two guys, and one refuses to talk to the other. And then it just sort of spills out from there, but it's a, it's a great actor's piece. It's beautiful. It's in a kind of fairy tale Ireland. And he's just a brilliant writer. The dialogue is brilliant. The way the story unfolds is shocking and terrifying. And okay, well, I'll definitely really take something. you up. On yeah. that advice. John, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, a reminder that Stand Up If You're Here Tonight is on at La Cave Café in Paris, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. We'll leave you with a clip of that film, The Banshees of Inishirin. Otherwise, do check out our website and our social media feeds for more arts and culture here on France 24. Now, if I've done something to you, just tell me what I've done to you. Well, you didn't do anything to me. I just don't like you no more. You didn't like me yesterday. Why does he not want to be friends with you no more? Why is he 12? What the hell's going on with you, me f***ing brother? He's dull, Siobhan. I mean, but he's always been dull. The other night, two hours, you spent talking to me about the things you found in your little donkey shite that day. Well, it wasn't me little donkey shite. It was me pony shite, which shows how much you were listening. War has once more reared its head in Europe, recalling the darkest hours of our history. Kiev is still about 30 kilometers away. France 24 is providing constant coverage of events in Ukraine. Our teams on the ground and in the studio will keep you informed of all the latest developments. Stay informed, stay aware. Liberté, égalité, actualité.